Hello and welcome to our review of Plunderbund, a game that's set in kind of a fancy version of Prohibition Chicago, where players are going to hire spies and goons in order to establish your own brand of black market goods, and you're also going to be distributing your agents and racketeers that are going to kind of control the various shops and try to fulfill their demands. But how does it play? Let's have a look. So at its heart, Plunderbund is kind of a light deck building meets area control kind of a game. It's an interesting concept where players are basically going to be keeping an eye on the four tracks, price, appeal, quality and ingenuity, using cards in order to move up these tracks whilst also getting pieces onto the board in terms of your agents and racketeers. They'll also have special abilities they can use. Now, at the same time, you also want to be keeping an eye on the demand on the board, which will be randomly generated as the game goes on. And when demand becomes available on the board, you want to be trying to get your agents on the board so you can be the one to fulfill it. Of course, things depending on how far you've moved up on the track as to who actually gets to fulfill that demand. Although you will also want to be using your racketeers in order to try and muscle them out of it when you basically can't compete with them on the actual market they're on. Now, you will also need to be able to fulfill those demands. You'll do that by trying to gain goods, which will go into your warehouses over the course of the game. But you also kind of want to keep an eye on how many people you've got on the board. Basically, the more people you have on the board, the better. Because the more people that are on any given area on the board, the better chance you've got of winning the gang war at the end of the game. When does the game end? Well, when 12 months is up with each kind of area split into seasons when you're going to be able to recruit new people at the end of each. So let's have a bit more of a deeper look into these rules. So how do you actually take your turn in Plunderbund? Well, if you've played deck building games before, you probably will already have a good idea of how this is done. Essentially, you have your deck, which has all of your cards in it. You will, at the beginning of the game, draw five cards from that deck, although it will increase later, and you basically get to play any amount of cards in your hand that you want on your turn. However, in this case, you may want to hold back from doing so. Basically, what happens is you have a few things you can do with the various cards in your hand. Some of them will allow you to move up on one of the four tracks that we mentioned earlier. Some will allow you to place agents and racketeers on the board or move them. Some might allow you to gain goods into your warehouse and others may have a few other tricky abilities on them. At the end of your turn, once you've played all the cards you want to, the cards go to your discard pile and you draw another five cards. When you run out of cards in your draw pile, you can shuffle the discard and make a new deck and carry on drawing cards from them. Essentially, this is basically how you take a turn in Plunderbund. So, when would you want to play a card and when wouldn't you? Well, what you actually have in your hand is a number of cards, some which will only have one ability that you can use on them, and some that may have multiple. Now, if you have multiple uh, actions on your card, you can only take one of them. What's more is everything has a favour cost on them. So when you decide to play that card, you take one of these favour cards and put it into your discard pile. Now, you don't really want to be holding too many favours because they're going to dilute your deck. And what's more is they are worth minus one point at the end of the game. Points being referred to as reputation in this game. So you may not want to take many favours. However, what you do have is you have the grey market which is shown on your player boards. At the beginning of the game, at a rate of 4 to 1, you can pay 4 goods stored in your warehouse to pay for one favour. You can do that as many times as you want on your turn in order to pay off as many favours as you want. However, you will have to remember that you want to keep those goods to be able to pay for demand on the board when it comes to scoring those sweet, sweet points later on. Now, if you're looking at your player board 
uh, you can actually see your grey market value on there. So it's going to start off, like I say, at four goods to one favour. This can be improved on the game by moving up certain tracks. You'll also notice it says your hand size on there, which will start at five. Again, if you improve yourself enough on the ingenuity track, you can hold car, uh, up to six cards in your hand, or maybe even seven, at which point, if you're gaining a lot of favour into your hand, you can just be discarding it at will, really. The other thing is you can on move up on the quality track. That's basically where you can start improving your odds of how many uh, goods you have to pay in order to pay for favours, eventually ending up at only playing just two goods for one favour. So players really want to bear that in mind as they're moving up these tracks on the board. Now, as mentioned before, it is important to note that you do not have to play all five cards that are in your hand. You may choose to only play two of them, but bear in mind that whatever you don't play still gets discarded at the end of your turn and you have to draw a new set of cards. Now, why would you want to only play some of the cards in your hand? Well, easy, really. You just don't want to dilute your hand too much with favour cards and really helps you focus on uh, your strategy, basically. Do you want to try and focus on your ingenuity and quality? Well, you may not want to focus so much on price and appeal. These mean, this means you are sort of limited with what goods or what demand you can fill on the board because it's important to note that you have to at least be on the bottom tier before you can actually start claiming goods that are on there, even if you're the only person on the space to be able to fulfill that demand. So once everyone around the table has taken a turn, you move up a month on the board, then you generate demand that's going to start appearing on all the shops, and you also start gaining a number of goods. How many you gain depends on where you are on the, each of the tracks. So you'll notice your price and your quality helps gain you goods into your warehouse, whereas the other side of the board, on all four tracks, you'll notice there's a blackish grey kind of uh, column, I suppose. And basically this tells you how much demand is going to be generated at the end of each month on the board. You'll do this by taking your black bag, which will be filled with all your demand tokens. You will draw for each one, and you will find the location on the board, and you will place it there. Basically, that's telling you that this shop here is demanding this good. And basically, any agents that are on the board in those spaces are going to battle it out to see who actually gets to fulfil that demand with a good and score points at the end of the season. So let's give you an example there. Uh, let's say that the blue player and the yellow player are both tackling that demand that's on that space. Whoever's higher on the track, so you'll look at the token, you'll see that is a blue token there which represents quality. Essentially, whoever's highest up the quality track gets to pay one of their goods and gain a point for that. However, you also have racketeers. So let's say the yellow player out of those two is actually the higher on the board. And then the blue player places a racketeer on there. The blue player then, before, uh, before resolving the demand, gets to take one demand off that space and score two points, therefore stealing that from them. And what's even better is you don't have to pay a good for it. Not bad going. Now, one thing to note is you may notice on the board there are a number of closed shops. Basically, they'll have a token like this on there with a little no entry sign on. That tells you that that shop is currently closed, but demand can be generated on there. However, when the shop's closed, you cannot place agents or racketeers on there. So, play will basically continue, and you'll keep moving through the months. However, after March, you'll notice it says End Season. This is where players will get to pick a new member of staff for their deck. So, you always have three people that are always available to you during the recruiting phase. You have a prospector, a trusted advisor, and a huckster. Like I said, they are always available on the board in case there's nothing particularly interesting that comes available. 
because you see you have this deck and what you're going to do is you're going to draw however many players there are plus one they are going to represent who is currently available to be hired and then starting with whoever has the relevant token basically these get distributed at the beginning of the game you have start players for each month but also whoever's the holder of the current season that we're moving into at the start basically gets to choose someone first and then play moves clockwise around the board so yeah you'll get to take one they go to your discard pile and soon you'll be able to get a brand new special ability that no one else on the board has. So this whole idea of a light deck building system, although interesting, is also kind of its first flaw. You see, unfortunately, it just means you can't invest too heavily in a strategy as to which which of these ladders you really want to climb and which ones you don't because you may not have the card that you need appear there let's say you're focusing on the quality track there is no guarantee that you'll have someone appear that can really help you boost your way up that track it means that essentially that period between the start of the game and the first recruitment phase you kind of don't really want to invest too heavily into a strategy and that's simply because it could make or break you sure you could take the risk have that perfect card appear and then really be on your way but here's the other problem that first recruitment phase doesn't come about until a quarter of the way through the game that means you are really holding out on really doing anything up until then it also means that in the games that we've played so far it seems like most people for the first quarter of the game either play everything that's in their hand and just swamps themselves down with favours before getting rid of them in the later rounds when they can develop a strategy or they simply focus on trying to get as many pieces on the board as possible as many agents and racketeers essentially like I say that's two different ways of adopting how to play I do, do genuinely find that more people than not don't like to invest in a strategy where they follow one or two different ladders and it's simply because they've been burnt before so really as interesting as it sounds it really kind of harms the play experience in a fairly big way so the part of the game that's a hell of a lot better in its execution is the area control aspect of the game we've already talked about it before but it really is worth diving into it a little bit more whereas you can sometimes feel as if the person that's winning after the first quarter of the game is kind of determined a bit by luck and sometimes when a player just through sheer luck gets so far ahead on the board it can be a bit frustrating however you can temper that very slightly by basically using your pieces on the board really well now Remember I said there were really two different tactics that people tend to use in this game in my experience. Well, the second tactic works really well, which is not really focusing too heavily on any of the tracks, maybe moving up one or such so that you can try and actually take some demand if no one else is in a shop. Basically, trying to just focus on getting people on the board and limiting the amount of favour that you're bringing into your deck is actually a very viable strategy. You see, as mentioned before, the game works by placing agents on the board which are going to help you to fulfil the demand that's currently on there. Essentially, like I said, if you get a number of agents that are all owned by different players on there, whoever gets to take each demand token depends on who's highest on the track. So you can have multiple demand on one space, so you may have a price, a quality, and an ingenuity token all on the same shop and let's say you're higher in one of them this is where the racketeer really becomes incredibly important you see your racketeer if you move them on there is going to be able to knock one of those tokens basically off the board and score you two automatic points now 
when the racketeer moves uh, basically gets rid of the token you really want to be knocking off the ones that you know other people are going to win so basically it leaves you open to take the demand of the ones you want now agents you can only ever have one of each player on each space however there can only ever be one racketeer from any player on each space so when you place your racketeer there it's kind of vital you see if you move your racketeer on there too early it's going to be really easy for someone else to move their racketeer on there on a later turn and knock them off there and into the local hangout now whilst they're in the hangout they don't really do anything at this point uh, however it means the other person that's just moved their racketeer on there is likely going to take the demand token that you want so that's really where the interesting part of this comes in it is worth mentioning that basically you score up all the demand tokens at the end of the season. Basically you get one point for every demand token that you get to fulfill with a good from your warehouse. And you get two points for every one that you deflected with good use of your racketeer. But it does mean there's a very tactical element as to when you actually do use your racketeers. Essentially the racketeers are the most interesting thing on the board. However... I would say the earlier problems mentioned with the deck mechanic of this game are probably going to make this point kind of moot. You see, I think the most you, pieces you can get on a board per season is likely going to be three. That's if you get really, really lucky. You see, you're only going to be playing cards from your hand three times over the course of the month. Even if you had that one card at least from the beginning of the game that allows you to place agents and racketeers let's say you had all three of them come up in on all three months which is possible it's just really really unlikely um, essentially it requires the use of your guild leader who can get you to draw extra cards basically from your hand allows you to play more if you don't have any favor in your hand which means basically you would have to not really focus on any of the tracks and use them that way now the reason i really say that that makes the point moot is because getting your pieces on the board still requires a certain element of luck however you can improve like i said improve your chances by not taking very much favor into your hand but it does mean that at least for the first quarter of the game everyone is kind of just going through the motions there's not a lot of variants or exciting events or anything like that in that period of time and that unfortunately it's that deck building that really brings this down a bit so really the best way I can really summarize all that and really bring it all home is to say that as gamers we always want to be doing things we don't want to be not doing things and that's kind of what this game is about, is on your turn choosing what you're not going to do and doing one or two things rather than five things, which is really unsatisfying as a gamer, especially when you take into account the fact that the game's kind of slow. You've probably gathered by now that there is a fair bit to think about. You've got closed shops that you're thinking do I try and get those open at some point or moving up some of the tracks which tracks to move up and which ones not to move up on if at all do you want to open up those special abilities soon despite the fact that there may not be so much odd there you know such things as improving how many goods you have to exchange for favors or your hand size do you want to chase that it's also worth noting that on the appeal track after a while you actually get points for moving up the track so every time you move up to the next level on the track you automatically score a point do you want to be getting loads of pieces on the board so that you can actually be moving up there is a hell of a lot to think about here and it means that things do kind of slow down we found that the game generally takes a long time i think the first time we played and bear in mind this is the first time we played it took about an hour and a half to just play through the first season which is an incredibly long amount of time admittedly we were learning the rules at the time but you still get an idea of how quickly this game moves from that and then you have the manual as well 
Now, this booklet, it's probably not written in the most ideal way. You see, most of the time you will mention all of the elements to the game at the very beginning of the book so everyone has a good idea of how to play. You see, there are a lot of people out there that when they get a game, they get a group of people around and they read the rules and play as they go. I'll admit, it's not the way I like to do things, but I know some people do. And we have had nights before where we've had a new game that's freshly out of its seal and everyone just wants to play it straight away and everyone says, I don't care how long it takes, let's just play the game and read through the rules as we do it. Now in Plunderbund, they fail to mention the gang war bit at the end of the game until the very end of the manual. So let me explain the gang war real quick before I go into this a bit more. Essentially, every person in each of these areas, you'll notice each one has a coloured area on. You've got the red, you've got the green, you've got the yellow and you've got the purple. Whoever has the most combined agents and racketeers in that area, including racketeers in that area's hangout, basically score five points, whereas whoever's in second place scores three and then one and so on. So essentially, however many pieces you've got on the board kind of gets you a nice little bonus score at the end. However, if you were to read page by page to get an idea of how the game goes, let me give you an example here. You may say to someone, okay, on your turn, you can do this, 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 and this, and then read the, uh, the relevant parts out of the guide. Now, people may not necessarily notice the importance of that unless there was a bit at the beginning that just basically said, by the way, there's going to be a gang war at the end that involves having as many pieces on the board as possible. It's a bit of a point scorer. Now, it's not the only fault that's in the game, that's in that manual. There's a couple of other things I want to point out as well. Now, a fairly common thing you'll find in a lot of gaming manuals is you'll have things like the anatomy of a card, you'll have the anatomy of the board, you'll have all these things. This doesn't really have it, at least for the board anyway. And we were left wondering for ages what these little symbols mean next to each of the numbers on the board. We've kind of made a bit of an educated guess as to its um, how likely certain demand tokens are to be drawn. So for example, the nine shop down here has two hearts by it, meaning that you're probably more likely to draw appeal demand for that shop than anything else. So players can preempt where they're going to go. Now, the last thing I really want to criticize the game guide for is closed shops. It mentions closed shops. It doesn't say how you open them. It actually turns out that there's a card that allows you to open up the shops. However, for my first two games of Plunderbund, we did not have that card become available. Now, where's the problem there? It's that we went through the game not knowing how to open shops, which was kind of confusing a bit. But essentially, these are things that really should be learned for any future games that they make. Um, it's worth mentioning just about everything in there. There's not even really anything in the guidebook that really tells you how to do it. Now, it is worth noting though, that there is kind of a card reference in the rules towards the back of it, but it's still kind of merited mention elsewhere in the guidebook because the fact that you're gonna probably have a lot of demand actually appearing on the clothes shops means that you really should be explaining earlier in the rules that there is a way to open the shops. Basically, it's on a card that you could get over the course of the game. But like I said, first two games, no ways of opening the shops at all, and it just very much confused us. So, I feel kind of bad about this, because it is an interesting game, and I think it actually becomes more enjoyable with more playthroughs. There's quite a lot I haven't mentioned about the game, such as certain synergies between cards, which when you play two cards together, uh, you can actually play some of the actions free without paying favours. So there's other stuff here, like I said, that I haven't mentioned. 
I've just kind of found that there's a really important point to be made with this game, which is that it's really easy to be put off by this game in the first couple of playthroughs. However, you tend to find that as people start understanding the systems in it a bit more, and probably the thing, one of the tactics that I said most people use in the game, which is play everything at once all the time, you kind of learn that that kind of throws you down a bit of a rabbit hole of gaining way too many favour cards, maybe not being able to focus too much, you may not get as many pieces on the board, so you might have moved all the way up the tracks. However, you can never have enough agents on the board to actually be able to take advantage of all of them. There's a lot of stuff like that in there that you're going to fall into in your first few games, and it's really easy to give up on Plunderbund and say it's a bad game. I think it's an interesting concept that is poorly executed and it's an absolute minefield for new players. You really have to play through this a few times before you really start to appreciate some of the systems that are in play here. I think it's also worth noting that the theme and the artwork on this game is beautiful. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, the presentation's great. I will say, this is not the Kickstarter version of the game. There is a deluxe version where these wooden meeple pieces are actually replaced by these little plastic models that are really, really cool. Um, saying that, this is actually still a really beautiful presentation even if you don't have a deluxe version of it, excuse me. Um, it's literally an interesting concept that's let down by a bit of poor execution. The best analogy I could really give is at the beginning of the game, in those first three months, it kind of feels as if you say have decided to throw a dinner party. However, at the moment you have no guests that you've invited, but you've got to start buying the ingredients for the food already. You don't know who's coming, you don't know what they like, and some of them may have allergies, so everything could go horribly wrong and you end up having a miserable time. Now, that all sounds a bit harsh, but once you know the pitfalls of the game, in later plays you can work your way around it. And I've now said this about three different times, and I think that's why it's really important. I've seen this game take an absolute lashing in a lot of board game reviews, and I know that some people will look at this review and say, well, you just did as well. However, there is some enjoyment to be had here with this game. And if the concept of it sounds really good to you, but these little things are just putting you off, it may be worth persevering with it and just giving it a bit more of a chance later on because it does get better with more plays. However, saying that, it still has a lot to answer for and you just cannot review this game without pointing out those faults because they are fairly massive faults and they are faults that are going to put some people off the game altogether. Now if you've enjoyed this review please do remember to give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends and if you haven't done already please subscribe to the channel. We've probably got some videos that will be appearing maybe around here in a little bit. Please do give them a click if you like like this video and check out some of our more more of our stuff if you'd like to follow us on social medias you can on twitter at everybody dice and on instagram at everybody dice show and hey if you really like this and want to help us out by throwing a couple of bucks our way we have a patreon at patreon.com forward slash everybody dice there you can find things such as our polls this was actually voted on by our patrons to review so we'll have one of those every month and you can join in on that for as little as one dollar a month as well as our audio newsletter that we now do which is available for patrons as well thank you very much for joining us we'll see you next time